Hello, my name is Bill Sellers. I'm the president of National History Academy and welcome to the latest edition of our series of live virtual tours of defining historic sites in the United States. Today, we're very privileged to go to Fort Ticonderoga in upstate New York with, uh, with Stuart Lilly. Um, and just to tell you a little bit about National History Academy, if, uh, if you haven't been a part of this uh, yet, uh, we, we started three years ago as a residential program, bringing students from all over the country to uh, the area just outside of Washington, DC, where we travel to over 35 um, historic sites of the country. We have 30 speakers um, engage in debates that were designed by the Case Method Institute that Harvard Business School professor uh, David Moss uh, put together. Um, we work with the College Board on a, a parliamentary debate program and civil discourse with the Braver Angels out of, out of New York. It's, it's, a, it's a fantastic program. And uh, last year we went online with a series of four one-week programs. Uh, this year we're offering eight one-week sessions over uh, uh, the month of July, uh, two sessions a week, and we also have a number of history workshops. Uh, one of those workshops is actually going to be with Fort Ticonderoga on archaeology. And uh, that's not posted on our website yet, but it, but it will be soon. Our enrollment for the summer is open right now. So please do check our, our website at www.nationalhistoryacademy.org. Uh, and we've got some, you know, both great opportunities currently listed and what we're going to have more uh, posted over the course of the next few weeks. So, um, you know, with that, I'm going to turn it over to the Fort Ticonderoga's Vice President of Public History, Stuart Lilly. Uh, Stuart has been building living history programs at Fort Ticonderoga for over 10 years. Uh, is a unique year-by-year uh, -year approach to highlight the many layers of stories of Ticonderoga's history over, over decades, you know, through the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries, and into the, into the 20th century, and, you know, now, and, uh, you know, and tying it to, tying it to the present, uh, you know, I've, I've visited with the team at uh, Ticonderoga about 18 months ago, and it's, a, it's really an inspiring and, and incredible uh, educational effort that they have put together. So with that, I will turn it over to Stuart. Uh, so here's Stuart Lilly. All right, Th uh, thank you so much for, for having me, and th thank you for the wonderful introduction, Bill. Um, I'm really in looking forward to talking with you all at the National History Academy today. Now, I'll go ahead and uh, share my, my screen here. There we go. So uh, Fort Ticonderoga to today, uh, we are a private, nonprofit organization. Uh, we are 2,000 acres, and this, believe it or not, this aerial view doesn't capture the, the entire extent of our, our grounds. Uh, we have two miles uh, of shoreline along Lake Champlain, uh, both on the, the Vermont and New York side. Uh, we have the most historic earthworks that survived from the Revolutionary War. Uh, and of course, we have the, the famous uh, recreated fort. Now, let me see if it advance. There we go. Now, throughout Fort history, over and over again is our location. Now, you can see here on this, the 1783 map, you can see there uh, is, is Fort Ticonderoga right there. And we exist at the confluence of where Lake George, uh, Lake George being right here, as well as Lake Champlain come together. Now, Lake George, uh, it drains to the north and it empties into what's called the Lachute River. The Lachute being the French word for the waterfalls. Uh, although the water that comes out of it drops 220 feet into the level of, of Lake Champlain. Lake Champlain, in turn, uh, also drains to the north, and we're about 25 miles downstream from the headwaters of the lake. Uh, you can go upstream on what's the south bay of Lake Champlain today, all the way up to what is Skeensboro at the end of the French and Indian War, what is the modern day town of Whitehall, New York. And from there overland, you're only about 14 miles to the Hudson River. Hudson River, of course, drains to the south, all the way to New York City and the Atlantic Ocean. Conversely, Lake George at its head is only about eight miles from the Hudson River. 
Now, Lake Champlain to the north of us, it drains for another 100 miles, eventually emptying into the Richelieu River. The Richelieu River, which uh, back in the 18th century actually had six different names. It was known as the, the Richelieu, the Seldom, the Sorrel, the Chambly, the Iroquois, and the St. John's River. It drains into the St. Lawrence River, and the St. Lawrence River was and is the heart of Canada. Now, in a time before you had a whole network of roads, these waterways were the manner in which people not only traveled, moved supplies and moved armies. And so Fort Ticonderoga's location on these waterways, time and time again, gave it such historic impact. Now, believe it or not, our historic impact goes all the way back to, too far. It goes all the way back to 1609. In fact, one of the first conflicts between uh, first European explorers, in this case, Samuel de Champlain, his Algonquin speaking warriors, as well as his uh, Iroquois, likely Mohawk speaking warriors, happened right here at the Ticonderoga Peninsula. In the summer of 1609, Samuel de Champlain rode with his Algonquin allies all the way up Lake Champlain to this peninsula the Iroquois and Mohawks watching him the entire way. And while there's a portent of things to come in Fort Ticonderoga's history, uh, the Iroquois built a small palisaded fort atop the, the rise that makes up the, the Fort Ticonderoga Peninsula, where Fort Ticonderoga sits today. They sortied out from that fort to do battle. And in the first firing of anger, of European weapons in this part of North America. Uh, Samuel de Champlain and two of his aides, they fired their arquebus and by their account, killed three chiefs with the, the two bullets. This was he put into his uh, voyages where he wrote about the entire trip, published in 1613. And so you have the first encounters between Europeans, Native Americans here at Ticonderoga, being one in which Europeans are dramatically outnumbered and we're seeing the introduction of European weaponry. Now, Fort Ticonderoga's modern, if you will, military history, I say our military story of the 18th century begins in 1755. Now, as strategic as a location as this Fort Ticonderoga was, the French and Indian War didn't begin here. It began out in the Ohio country, not, not too far from modern day Ohio. There, uh, General Washington, uh, this time just a colonel, uh, got himself surrounded and captured at Fort Necessity. His uh, papers that he signed for uh, agreeing to surrender, they were published back in France, and they said that he had been a paid assassin to kill Captain Jumonville. The British, well, they began amassing expeditions. One, which would be pulled together with Sir William Johnson, his Majesty's uh, agent to the Northern tribes, those Northern Native American tribes, they assembled at the south end of Lake George with New Yorkers, New Englanders, as well as many Mohawk allies. The French, they shipped over six battalions of infantry from France. Uh, four of these would end up in Canada itself. And an expedition led by the commander of the French Army in North America, Baron Dieskau, they proceeded up Lake Champlain all the way to Ticonderoga, or as the French called it, Carrion. They arrived here on September 3rd, 1755. They heard about the expedition of Sir William Johnson assembling at the south end of Lake George. They headed with a portion of Canadians, uh, many Kanoake, or uh, Catholic Mohawk warriors up the South Bay, and they met this uh, New England, New York, and Mohawk force at the Battle of Lake George on September 8, 1755. Baron Dieskau, he was severely wounded, the party was thrown back, and with this loss, the French began entrenching here at Carrion as this became the front lines of the defense of New France. Now, over the next four years, this was where the French held the line against British invasion. That assumption that they would be driving from the south 
into French Canada. And so in the spring of 1756, the French began construction of a proper fort in earnest. Now, a French Canadian captain named Michel Chartier de Lobinier, he was tasked with the governor of Canada himself to begin the construction of Fort Carrion. Here atop the, the Ticonderoga Peninsula, he laid out this fort, which though Fort Ticonderoga looks strategically to the south, the entire fort actually points off to the north and west, the two most likely directions from which the British would lay their siege. Now, French soldiers who did the, the majority of this work, well, you could imagine beginning in the spring of 1756, they began clearing all the timber from this peninsula, cutting down huge oak, fir, and even some maple trees in all directions, and began stacking those logs up to create the bastions, these angled corners of this fort. They dug down until they hit bedrock, and then you notice this kind of tan shaded area all the way around the west and north side. Well, there to create the ditch, it would help make those sides more defensible. It actually blasted out the stone. Imagine one French soldier at a time holding a giant masonry chisel while another French soldier drove that into the ground with a sledgehammer. Then they would pour gunpowder into those holes, light a fuse, and run away. Now, they would blast it out so much stone to create this ditch, which is six and eight feet deep in places that the initial soldiers' barracks to the south, uh, officers' barracks to the west, those, they actually went ahead and rebuilt them in stone beginning in 1757. They also began the construction of works to the west, these extra triangles that point on the, the west side and north side, what were known as demi looms. They went ahead and faced those in stone as well. Now, this fort was always under construction even as the French prepared to blow it up. Now, in the summer of 1757, a new French commander, the Marquis de Montcalm, he arrived at Carrion. He brought, assembled together his not only French army soldiers, but also with calls going out all the way to as far west as modern North Dakota, he brought together the largest Native American war party ever assembled. These 1,800 Native American warriors, well, they headed all the way up Lake George to attack Fort William Henry in August of 1757. Now, at the end of the ca successful capture of Fort William Henry, many of the Marquis de Montcalm's Native American allies, they were eager to take home prisoners, as well as take spoils of war to show their success in battle. The Marquis de Montcalm, he had terms with the, the British and American garrison where there, whereby they were paroled. They were to go back to Albany. Now, as the column of British and American prisoners marched south, well, they were set upon by the Marquis de Montcalm's Native American warriors. And even as he, the Marquis de Montcalm used his own French soldiers to block them, this became the massacre of Fort William Henry a massacre which was used in the British press as a rallying cry for, this, for an attack in 1758. Now, this does sound familiar. It was all made legendary by the book, Last of the Mohicans, by James Fenimore Cooper in 1826, and of course, the classic 1990s movie with Daniel Day-Lewis by the same name. In 1758, a new British commander, James Abercrombie, he assembled at the south end of Lake George, the largest British and American army ever assembled in, to this point. This army of 16,000 British and American soldiers, with Americans from New York, New Jersey, and all across New England, they set forth from the south end of Lake George in a column of bateaus, flat bottom boats about 30 feet long, about eight feet wide, it was three miles long. They landed at the north end of Lake George on July 6, 1758. Now, 
the Marquis de Montcalm, he had actually been preparing works at the north end of Lake George to oppose a landing. But by July, end of the day on July 6, he decided that the best place to make his stand against this British and American force that outnumbered him more than four to one was not to wait at the head of Lake George, nor was it to sit inside Fort Carrion, which was still under construction. No, instead, he was to make his stand on the hill a half mile off to the west. And you can see the zigzag line that's up there, little, uh, but are tiny little tents there in this French map of the ensuing battle. There, atop the heights of Carrion, in 48 hours, the Marquis de Montcalm's 3,500 French soldiers cut down every tree in sight. They took the logs, stacked them up eight feet high, in these zigzag lines that corresponded with the likely directions of attack. And they took the tops of the trees, what they called abati. These treetops with the sharpened branches arrayed outwards actually extended all the way from the Lachute River to the south, up and around the heights of Carrion, that hill they had built the log breastwork upon, all the way to Lake Champlain to the east, fencing off this entire peninsula. Now, the British, with James J. Abercrombie, they hoped to land artillery, you know, five bronze six-pounders and one six-inch howitzer, right to the south of the Lachute Bay. And they probably would have landed, except the guns of Fort Carrion. You can see the lines that are drawn right in here of the, on this map. Those represent the cannon shots fired from the west side of, of the fort. They caught the British artillery barges. They failed to land. And so over the course of the day of eight hours of battle on July 8, 1758, waves after waves of British and American soldiers attempted to cement the French lines, that fortified position the French had built upon that hill. Over the course of these eight hours, the British and Americans took 2,000 casualties. Now the French, for their part, they were hardly unscathed. They took 500 casualties, proportionally far worse than the British and Americans did. And it was much to their surprise that they found by July 9th that the British and Americans evacuated, headed right back up Lake George to wait for another year to make their attack. Now, the following year, 1759, well, the French were not so lucky. By the summer of 1759, Quebec City itself was now under siege by General James Wolfe. The French, they could merely spare about a thousand soldiers in the entire Champlain Valley, merely a rear guard of 400 French soldiers who they left behind at Fort Carrion to hold out as long as they could. These French soldiers, they now faced 11,000 British and American soldiers under the command of General Jeffrey Amherst, the commander in chief of the British Army in North America. General Jeffrey J Amherst's army quickly captured the heights of Carrion, that hill the army had fought for so dearly the previous year. Once they had captured the heights of Carrion, he, his British and American soldiers, began building entrenchments and cannon batteries to begin the bombardment of Fort Carrion. All the while, French artillerymen on the west side of the fort, they fired every cannon and mortar they could. In fact, one Massachusetts soldier wrote of a mortar bomb landing in their trenches on the heights of Carrion every single minute for hours on end. By 11 o'clock on July 26, 1759, the French began their evacuation. They set fire to all of the buildings that were to the south side of the fort, warehouses that had supplied the fort's construction. They set a long fuse all the way into the southeast bastion of the fort where the powder magazine was, lit the fuse, climbed in their bateau and began rowing north. By 11 o'clock, the fuse hit the powder magazine and 20 tons, that's 40,000 pounds of black powder blew up Fort Carrion. It took General Jeffrey Amherst three days of firefighting before he could claim the ruins of Fort Carrion 
rename them Fort Ticonderoga and begin its reconstruction. Now, by the summer of 1760, three British and American armies converged on Montreal. And by September, though the French army, it surrendered. Fort Ticonderoga continued their construction and even continued under construction right through 1763 as the Treaty of Paris ended the French and Indian War. And indeed, Fort Ticonderoga remained garrisoned by British soldiers long after, just in case there was an uprising amongst the peoples of French Canada, both Canadian as well as formerly French allied Native Americans. And yet, ironically enough, it ended not being the people of New France who rebelled against British rule, it ended up being the people of New England, and of course, specifically the people of Boston. Now, down in Boston, of course, they got themselves in a whole lot of hot water with the Boston Tea Party back in 1774. Now, in the Boston Tea Party, or at least the, the aftermath of it, the port of Boston was closed, uh, the Massachusetts Assembly was disbanded, the entire colony of Massachusetts was placed under martial law. The, the Massachusetts created their own illegally meeting legislative body, the Massachusetts Provincial Congress, which quite famously, well, they had all the various towns minute companies drilling on every town common every single week. They stockpiled arms and ammunition. At the same time, though, by March of 1775, they sent a Pittsfield, Massachusetts lawyer here to Ticonderoga to scout out the place, much as you would have seen it in this late 1759 map. Now, John Brown, he scouted out for Ticonderoga and reported back to the Provincial Congress that the walls, they were falling apart. Indeed, the logs had long since rotted out, soil was spilling anywhere. He said that the powder magazine, now in the Southwest Bastion, destroyed about a pound of powder every single day with moisture. And the place was filled with cannons and the British guard was small. He also went across Lake Champlain into what we now call Vermont, where at the time was known as the New Hampshire Grants, and there he said that the settlers there were rough and tough and would happily fight for money. He even went all the way into Canada and there found that the Canadians, though they, they hadn't rebelled against British rule, they might well be induced to join a rebellion. All of this information, which was eagerly picked up, as it might be useful in case a war broke out. Indeed, by April 11th of 1775, the Massachusetts Provincial Congress had secured the military alliance of other New England colonies in case war break out, broke out there as well. Now, by April 19th, of course, you have the shots heard around the world where history books say a bunch of farmers just spontaneously appeared, though clearly there had been a great deal of actual military preparation. However you uh, slice it though, by the end of the day on April 19th, there was now a war on, and specifically a siege of Boston for which the Massachusetts Provincial Congress was desperate to get cannons. Now into Cambridge rode a Connecticut ship captain and militia captain by the name of Benedict Arnold. He arrived on May 2nd and pitched an idea to raise a regiment of soldiers in Massachusetts, head to Ticonderoga, capture the fort and bring its legendary cannons back to Boston. He would proceed it on his way with a colonel's commission on May 3rd, not knowing that Connecticut joined the war on the side of Massachusetts. They had already created their own committee for the capture of Ticonderoga and Crown Point. Being Congregationalists, they had nothing but committees. This committee left Hartford on April 28th. They proceeded on horseback and stealthily all the way to Pittsfield, Massachusetts. There they recruited John Brown. John Brown recommended recruiting Ethan Allen. Ethan Allen, who had been one of the leaders of the Green Mountain Boys. This whole force of you know, Connecticut officers, uh, militia and officers like John Brown from Massachusetts and the Green Mountain Boys, this paramilitary force who had been fighting New York land claims, they proceeded north to Castleton, what's now Castleton, Vermont. There, 
They were met by Benedict Arnold, who claimed by virtue of his commission to be in command of the expedition. After a whole bunch of negotiation, it was agreed that Ethan Allen and Benedict Arnold would be co-colonels of this expedition. And they proceeded north from Castleton to Shoreham, Shoreham what's now Shoreham, Vermont, directly across the lake from Fort Ticonderoga. Now, part of the expedition went to Skeensboro, or modern day Whitehall. There they attacked the manor of Major Philip Skeen, a British officer, a French and Indian War veteran, now major landholder. And it was hoped that 11 boats captured at Skeensboro could arrive in time to bring the entire party of 220 Green Mountain Boys and Massachusetts militia over to Fort Ticonderoga. Unfortunately, on the night of May 9th, they only had two boats available. And this dodging thunderstorms throughout that rainy night, they only managed to ferry 82 of the 220 over to the New York shore. It was decided at 3.30 in the morning that they should go ahead and make their attack anyway. So they rushed through the gates of Fort Ticonderoga, found 42 British soldiers, 24 women and children asleep in their beds. And then upon the staircase, the officer's barracks, Ethan Allen, he claimed in his memoirs that he said to the commander of this fort, Captain William Delaplace of the 26th Regiment of Foot, in the name of the great Jehovah and the Continental Congress, I hereby claim this fort and all effects of King George III. It's a great quote. Unfortunately, we have five different accounts of what happened. Two of those accounts are from Ethan Allen, and Ethan Allen doesn't agree with Ethan Allen. Ethan Allen actually talked to second in command of this fort, Lieutenant Jocelyn Feltham. And by Feltham's account, what Ethan Allen actually said was, if any of your men shoot, find those British soldiers, I will kill every man, woman, and child in this fort. It's not surprising then that Lieutenant Feltham said that Benedict Arnold talked in a more genteel fashion. Nor is it that surprising that when Captain William Delaplace did finally emerge from his quarters, fully clothed, mind you, he surrendered the fort to Benedict Arnold. Benedict Arnold, who gave them terms by which the British soldiers and their families would be marched off to captivity in Hartford, Connecticut, there to be exchanged when possible. Now, the next day, a party of Green Mountain Boys proceeded north to Fort Crown Point, a huge thousand-man British fort built at the end of the French and Indian War, which would have still been huge had it not burned down in 1773. The eight soldiers that were posted there didn't put up much of a fight. Now, initially, the Continental Congress, they were appalled. They had not authorized this. and They even talked about giving Fort Ticonderoga back. However, very quickly, they realized that they had an opportunity. There were only two regiments of British soldiers in Lower Canada. They just captured 50 of the soldiers. They might well be able to make Canada into the 14th colony. So in August of 1775, an army under General Richard Montgomery assembled here at Fort Ticonderoga. This army, at the very end of that month, proceeded down Lake Champlain and slowly but surely captured British posts along the Richelieu River, like St. John's and Chambly. They arrived at Montreal and there they captured the city so quickly that the governor of Canada, Governor General Guy Carleton, just barely escaped the city, rowing under the cover of darkness in disguise towards, Mon towards Quebec City. Now, all the while, Benedict Arnold, who briefly commanded Fort Ticonderoga, he, in June of 1775, got frustrated, resigned, and went back to Cambridge, where he pitched a plan to Washington, whereby he would go up the Kennebec River in Maine and down the Dead and Chautier Rivers to attack Quebec City directly from the south side. After an epic struggle against the wilderness, he arrived at Point Levis to the south side of the St. Lawrence River from Quebec City as General Montgomery's army arrived too. Victory in Canada looked so certain that General Washington 
dispatched a young Boston bookseller, now Colonel of the Continental Army's artillery, Henry Knox, to Ticonderoga to finally bring the guns of Boston, guns back to Boston. He came through the archway of Fort Ticonderoga, right below our soldiers' barracks on December 5th, 1775. Now he selected, not only from Fort Ticonderoga's guns, but those captured at Crown Point and Chambly and St. John's, he selected 59 cannons, mortars, and howitzers, 60 tons of ordnance of all, in the course of 60 days, he proceeded all the way from Fort Ticonderoga, up the Lachute River by boat, up the Portage Road, that road that goes from the level of the Lake Champlain up to Lake George. He proceeded up Lake George on a big raft with all this artillery. And when he arrived at the south end, he had hired teamsters with horses, began pulling sleds, sleds that made their way all the way to Albany along the Hudson River. He crossed the Mohawk River on the west side. He crossed back over the Hudson River, over the Berkshire Mountains, over the Connecticut River, all the way to Cambridge, Massachusetts in 60 days in the dead of winter. The cannons that he brought to Cambridge, well, most of them would be installed on Dorchester Heights to the south side of the city. Those cannons, well, they surprised the British on March 16th. They made plans to evacuate. And when the wind was finally in their favor, they left on March 17th. Now, success in the American siege of Boston coincided with things going way downhill in the American siege of Quebec. Benedict Arnold and Richard Montgomery, they began to get desperate through December. And so they tried on New Year's Eve, 1775, to rush through the gates on opposite sides of the city at dawn. Well, the, the best news I've got is that Benedict Arnold, he was severely wounded. I say that's the best news because Richard Montgomery was killed outright. Benedict Arnold, he continued to command the siege from his hospital bed. And after the siege of Boston was won, the Continental Congress shipped reinforcements as fast as they could up the Hudson River to save this American army in Canada. Now, this American siege of Quebec what ended up being ultimately doomed, not by British forces, but by a disease called smallpox. Smallpox began to run ragged through the army there. By the time the British arrived, uh, marching through the gates of Quebec City on May 5th, 1776, about a third of American soldiers were sick with smallpox. The British began chasing them in grand style, all the way back up the St. Lawrence River, up the Richelieu River, beginning a long retreat that eventually ended here at Ticonderoga. Now, when the American Army arrived back here at Ticonderoga, they had to first rebuild this army. And so you saw inside of Fort Ticonderoga itself, you saw the work of bringing the army back to health. You saw the commissary slaughtering cattle so that hungry men could have fresh beef. You saw church services and court martials so the army had hope and discipline again. You saw craftsmen making clothes for soldiers who had lost their uniforms. And you saw carpenters making cannon carriages to mount the guns that would defend this place. All the while, soldiers dug in all around Fort Ticonderoga, or as the Americans called it, the Old French Fort. Well, New England soldiers, they began over on the Vermont shore, constructing what would be dubbed Mount Independence. There, a series of cannon batteries and fortified positions looked down Lake Champlain. Over on the heights of Carrion that the French had defended back in 1758, there, Pennsylvania soldiers began the construction of new old French lines, more or less along where the positions had been constructed in 1758, now out of earth with cannons. They renamed that hill Liberty Hill. New Jersey soldiers, they built a series of smaller fortifications to the east of Liberty Hill, the largest of which was right along Lake Champlain shore that they dubbed the New Jersey Redoubt, in honor of the fact that New Jersey soldiers made that. 
Now, all the while you had construction going on on land, on the water, there was the construction of a Lake Champlain fleet. This fleet, which was part of the Northern Continental Army, it was not the Continental Navy by any means, this fleet was eventually 15 vessels strong. And it ended up under the command of Benedict Arnold. Benedict Arnold, who would lead that fleet 50 miles down Lake Champlain to meet a British fleet at the Battle of Valcour Island. Though technically Benedict Arnold lost, in fact, only four of the 15 vessels of Lake Champlain, Lake Champlain fleet would remain on the water, those crews that either made it back on the water or hiked overland from their scuttled vessels, they were greeted as the heroes of Valcour Bay. For once they arrived, the fortifications had been complete, and the American army, which had struggled to survive its retreat from Canada, grew to 13,000 well-drilled, well-disciplined soldiers who mounted all of their fortified positions when the British finally arrived on October 28th, 1776. The British commander, Governor General Guy Carleton, he looked on the feast of martial splendor before him and decided it was not possible to take Ticonderoga in that year. It's worth pointing out the exact same day, perhaps even nearly to the hour, you had the Battle of White Plains down in uh, Hudson Valley of New York, where Washington was driven back from New York City forever. Now, the victory at Ticonderoga, unfortunately, was short-lived. As in going into 1777, the Continental Congress did not believe there was going to be another British attack, and so sent only 3,500 soldiers to man these massive positions. At the same time, a new British commander by the name of John Burgoyne, he made his attack much earlier. He arrived three miles to the north of Fort Ticonderoga on Lake Champlain, a place kind of dubbed a three mile point because of its distance. He arrived there on June 30th. And he arrived with the goal, not just of driving the American army from Ticonderoga, but hopefully, having a climactic battle here in which he would surround and capture the entire army. On July 2nd, he landed his German soldiers, soldiers principally from a place called Brunswick in New Jersey. He landed them on the Vermont shore with the goal of marching all the way around to the south side of Mount Independence and cut off the military road to escape from there. He landed his British soldiers the same day on the New York shore with the goal of first marching over the Lachute River, the river that drains out of Lake George, and then eventually getting up Mount Defiance, which overlooks Fort Ticonderoga to the south and west, and cut off that avenue of retreat as well. By July 4th of 1777, his British soldiers succeeded in crossing the Lachute River. They built a bridge. By the morning of July 5th, they were building a road all the way from Three Mile Point up Mount Defiance. They built a cannon battery overlooking Fort Ticonderoga and began offloading two bronze 12 pounder cannons from their fleet way back at Three Mile Point. Without any of the Army's artillery horses to move them, 300 soldiers had to drag these cannons through this wooded road but they got them in position overlooking Fort Ticonderoga by 5 p.m. At the same time, by everyone's account, the German soldiers were now 12 hours from cutting the military road. The American commander, General Arthur St. Clair, he was forced to make a choice. Did he stay to the last man and preserve his honor? Or with an army of veteran Continental Army soldiers, did he preserve his army? and get out while he still could. Thankfully, he chose the latter. And over the night of July uh, 5th into 6th, he succeeded in getting the majority of his army by marching off the south end of Mount Independence by 2 a.m. A rear guard of 400 followed at dawn. It would be met by the British advance guard who was frustrated to find that the Americans had escaped and would catch up to the rear guard of the American force at the Battle of Hubbardton on July 7th. 
Most of St. Clair's force made it safely south all the way to Stillwater, New York, where they would form the nucleus of a new American army. They would assemble under General Horatio Gates and eventually meet, stop, and surround and capture that army of General John Burgoyne in the battles of Saratoga. Now, all the while, Ticonderoga, well, it remained in a British post. And John Brown, the same John Brown from 1775, he, as a colonel, was authorized by General Benjamin Lincoln of Massachusetts to make an attack against Ticonderoga with the goal of dividing, diverting, and harassing any of those places that were keeping General Burgoyne's army fed. Now, with 500 Massachusetts militia, some Vermont state rangers, as well as some Vermont regulars, he descended the ridge line between Lake George and Lake Champlain, arriving overlooking the landing at Lake George on September 18th. At dawn, he swept out of the morning mist. There, he caught the British Guard completely by surprise and succeeded in freeing about 300 American prisoners of war captured back in July. At the same time, Brown's forces, they captured uh, four companies of His Majesty's 53rd Regiment of Foot, those soldiers who had been the guard of the prisoners of war, and what seems like a bad action movie, Brown had the former American prisoners of war now take the captured British soldiers into captivity with their very own guns and arms. Ethan Allen's younger cousin, Ebenezer Allen, he ascended Mount Defiance. He quickly captured the British guard posted on top of the mount, and he found in the same battery that had overlooked the fort back in July, he found a British bronze 12 pounder cannon and he opened fire on British held Fort Ticonderoga with the British's own cannon. British soldiers, mostly from the hospital on Mount Independence, as well as Brunswick, Brunswick soldiers, they responded with captured American cannons still on the wall. Colonel Brown's forces, they recaptured Liberty Hill and many of the redoubts turned recaptured American cannons on the fort as well. And everyone began trading shots all around the whole great camp of Ticonderoga and Mount Independence for the next three days. Though John Brown didn't succeed in capturing Fort Ticonderoga back for the Americans, he left the entire Gaut British Guard on guard, unable to send food south to General Burgoyne. Brown broke off contact on September 21st, joined the battle at Saratoga, leaving the British behind. Once the British heard of the news of General Burgoyne's capture, they requested permission from Governor General Guy Carleton to leave. And on November 9th, with permission to leave, artillerymen, His Majesty's Royal Artillery, set charges inside of Fort Ticonderoga, lit the fuse, and rode away. One German soldier, as he rode north down Lake Champlain, he described it as if he was looking back, back on God's wrath on Sodom and Gomorrah as the gunpowder blew up Fort Ticonderoga. Now, Fort Ticonderoga was visited by the British one more time in 1758, or excuse me, 1781, almost at the same time as closing days of the Battle of Yorktown. The British actually rebuilt the roof of one of the barracks, and then they decided that they had lost the advantage, went ahead and blew up the fort once more, and retreated back into Canada to close out the last days of the Revolutionary War. Now, in 1783, General George Washington, he actually visited the Ticonderoga Peninsula for the very first time having heard about it in his correspondence for, for years, but never seen the place. Fort Ticonderoga was transferred to New York State, and then New York State granted the entire peninsula, half of it to Columbia College, half of it to Union College. Now, the ruins of Fort Ticonderoga, if you look in this detail from this 1838 portrait of William Ferris Powell, you can see the ruins right there. 
the ruins began to get picked over by local citizens who used the nicely cut stone made by French Canadian masons to start building their foundations and fireplaces. It all would have been destroyed were it not for William Ferris Powell. William Ferris Powell had been a Columbia graduate. He bought the entire peninsula in 1820 and fenced off the ruins of Fort Ticonderoga, a tremendous act of historic preservation ahead of its time if you consider that the great events of the Revolutionary War were less than 43 years prior at Fort Ticonderoga. Imagine what we know to today is well, 43 years old and would have such historic significance. He built a home, which you can see on that detail, right below the ruins of Fort Ticonderoga and watched over this place as Fort Ticonderoga became a tourist attraction in its own right. Even folks like Thomas Jefferson and James Madison toured this place in 1791. People actually would take stagecoach tours of the carry-on battlefield and get their photo taken with the ruins of the old barracks. Now, Fort Ticonderoga would have stayed as ruins were it not for the work of Sarah Gibbs Thompson Pell and Stephen Hyatt Pell. Sarah Gibbs Thompson Pell attended a Town of Ticonderoga Historical Society event in 1908. The town of Ticonderoga Historical Society had hired uh, this nice English man named Alfred Bossom to reconstruct the officers' barracks of Fort Ticonderoga. Stephen and Sarah Pell, they liked the idea so much, they took it over. And they had the barracks of Fort Ticonderoga, at least the officers' barracks, which was about two-thirds still intact. They had it reconstructed, so we opened for the first time as a museum as of July 6th, 1909. And we've opened every single summer ever since. Now they began a reconstruction project that continued in 1931 with the soldiers barracks and in 2008 with the Mars Education Center, a rebuilt version of the French Magasin du Roi or King's Storehouse. And even as we speak, we're doing touches on that house that William Ferris Pell built in 1826. Now that brings us to who we are again today. Thanks to the legacy of the, the Pell family, we are able to bring to life for our visitors our 25 years of almost continuous military history for about 75,000 visitors annually here and to folks like you from coast to coast. So, Thank you. And at this time, if we have any questions, I'm more than happy to answer them. Great. Thank you. All so right. So I'm seeing in chat right here. I guess I guess. Yeah. We've got oh, okay. a in the chat and then some are coming in from Facebook. So I'll just read them out to you if that's easier. Oh, beautiful. Okay. Yeah, um, that sounds great. During the 1700s, was there a settlement outside of the fort? So during the, the, the 18th century, uh, you know, at least initially, there's uh, there's not a lot of settlement in the immediate vicinity of, of Fort Ticonderoga, or certainly Fort Carrion, eventually Fort Ticonderoga. Um, you know, even you know, going way back, um, you know, though Ticonderoga, which is, which is a, originally from a Mohawk word that means place between the waters, um, though it was part of Mohawk uh, land, there was only a temporary fishing camps. Now that began to change in 1759. Um, a lot of New England provincial soldiers uh, after uh, the fall of Fort Carrion and the fall of the, what was Crown Point, uh, they built a, a road back into the heart of New England and then began considering uh, buying up land. So by 1761, many of the same uh, provincial soldiers who had fought in 1759 they began creating towns in what they called the New Hampshire Grants, um, what's now Vermont. And so by the, the time of the, even before the Revolutionary War, you have a lot of settlers who are just across Lake Champlain from Fort Ticonderoga. Though settlement in what becomes the town of Ticonderoga would be delayed until after the Revolutionary War. Where does the Black Watch Royal Highland Regiment come in? Uh, the, the 
Royal Highland Regiment comes in in our French and Indian War story uh, during the great 1758 Battle of Carrion. It's, it's kind of an amazing statistic. Uh, the, the Black Watch, they make a series of charges on the right of the French line. And in the most, uh, well, most ferocious of those charges, they succeeded in not only getting through the Abati, all the, those tree, lamp, tree branches pointed outwards, they actually got up onto the, the log wall that the, the French had constructed. Now in the course of doing that, and then being driven all the way back, they took 500 of the 2,000 casualties that the British took in that day, which is even more staggering when you consider that the entire Black Watch Regiment was a little under 1,000. So every one Black Watch soldier and two was killed in that battle. Now, the, the, the Black Watch, of course, they were, remained part of the, the northern of this British Army, and they would kind of get to be back in the fight in 1759 and be part of the, the victors of the capture in that year. Did they have reenactments of the battle when it first opened to the public, or did those come much later? Um, actually, yeah. So one of the kind of crazy, not a crazy thing, but uh, during the centennial uh, of events of the Revolutionary War, there actually are uh, old photos of some of the reenactments, um, and even at the uh, the, the one. The 150th anniversary, um, there were, in, so in the 1920s, there were very elaborate reenactments, that, and especially of Ethan Allen's capture of Fort Ticonderoga. That, that was what they wanted to reenact. Now, one other kind of really early reenactment, surprisingly early. So when news of the, the French victory in the Battle of Carrion made its way all the way back to the, the royal court in 1758, there was actually a reenactment of the Battle of Carrion for the King Louis the Fifteenth in October of 1758 at Versailles. Um, with all that said, of course, reenactments as we know them today really be began in earnest during the, the bicentennial. Thank you. Um... What are some of the exhibits offered at Fort Ticonderoga today? And do you have a favorite? Hmm, the favorite one, that's, that's a tough part to, to answer. Um, so, so right now, uh, the exhibits that we have on display, we have a chronological exhibit, which is sort of objects from different periods in Fort Ticonderoga's history along with our timeline. We have the Bullets and Blades exhibit, which shows not only uh, many of our, the good examples from our, our arms collection, it also underpins the origin of a lot of American styles of arms, as, as broadly we focus on uh, America's military heritage coming out of the 18th century. Um, we have a neat exhibit on the legacy of Ticonderoga, including the, the various uh, USS Ticonderogas that have existed over the years. Um, we have a changing exhibit about the year we portray, uh, this year with us portraying 1774, uh, we have a great exhibit about the British garrisons between the French and Indian War and the Revolutionary War. And our latest exhibit is all about uh, the militia, especially in America with its colonial origins, as well as kind of flourishing in the, the early federal period, and also a comparison with the British militia, the French militia, and the Canadian militia, which have a uh, neat uh, contrasts. Other than the different exhibits, how do you emphasize the different periods in the Ford's history through your education programs? Yeah, so with our, our living history programming, which includes um, musket and cannon demonstrations, it includes soldiers life programs like, you know, cooking the, the daily uh, dinner. Uh, it in also includes historic trades like tailoring, shoemaking, carpentry, uh, boat building, sail making, rigging, uh, and uh, heritage livestock uh, work with our, our oxen. Um, we 
change what we do every single year uh, to portray a different different army. So, you know, let's say it's 1758. Um, we've portrayed uh, French soldiers as well as French artillery. And just about every aspect of what we do changes within these different activities that we do. Uh, we even have our, our fife and drum corps and we make the tremendously elaborate drummers uniforms of these different armies and change the musical instruments and, and the tunes. That's great. Have there been any new sources that have come to light in recent years that have changed the interpretation of the history? Yes, and, and by recent years, I would say recent days. I mean, like, the, the, we're, we're constantly researching, um, you know, constantly digging deeper into, uh, you know, different letters and diaries, uh, different maps, different correspondence. And you know the the great thing about you know interpretation is it, it is so flexible. And as we learn more, we change not only how we think about things, but we change how we you know, por portray it to to our visitors. Um, you know, one of the neat things about looking at 1774 is we've gained a much deeper understanding of the British garrison, especially on the eve of the capture of this fort. I mean, for for a long time, although. You know, we we kind of recognize that they were you know they're real British soldiers they were you know from a regiment we had no idea their like deep connections in America their Scottish legacy I mean we just we were constantly learning more and and that's what makes it so enjoyable. I've had a, a lot of comments come through the Facebook chat just people who have been there before and looking forward to going back and there is some uh, okay. questions about. Uh, is there a way to contact you or an email address or people want to learn more? Sure. Um, if you go to our, our website, uh, www.forttaiconderoga.org, uh, if you go to our staff page, uh, my email, um, slily, L-I-L-I-E, at Fort Ticonderoga, it's, it's right there uh, on our uh, links to staff. That's great. Thank you for sharing. Uh, is there any African American history at the site? Absolutely. Um, we've we've been you know, looking deeper and deeper into this topic, and we find um, whether it's um, uh, black soldiers within the French army uh, who are surprisingly numerous, especially in the the French regiments that were here. Um, black soldiers amongst uh, provincial soldiers from New England in the French and Indian War, or um, African-American soldiers uh, with New England regiments in the Revolutionary War. I'd say there are um, soldiers of color here in every single period in our military history. Um, and it was, a, it, was a, it was a point of contention, especially during the Revolutionary War. Um, there's actually a, a riot that happens here in 1776 on Christmas Day, uh, with, partly because Pennsylvania officers uh, objected to the integration of New England soldiers. I mean, you had white soldiers who fought elbow to elbow with Native American soldiers and African American soldiers, and officers, New England officers, were comfortable with that. And then it erupts with you know, soldiers actually opening fire on each other. Um, one of the, uh, albeit he, uh, a fellow named Prince Taylor, who's an African-American soldier from Massachusetts, um, though he did not specifically fight at Ticonderoga, his land claim that he received as part of his service in the Continental Army, he took that at Ticonderoga and actually uh, saddled uh, the fourth end of Lake George right after the Revolutionary War uh, to the point that uh, Thomas Jefferson, as he wrote about his trip, note, noted that there was this uh, African-American landowner who had uh, several local white workers tending his land. Uh, and it survives the, you know, the legacy of what is uh, today Black Point Road continues that that farm of uh, Prince Taylor. Thank you. And we are just about out of time, so I think we'll take one more question, if that's all right with you. 
Sure. As we work to teach history with a more inclusive lens, who are some of the voices that are typically left out when telling this history and have they been added or are you looking at adding in more voices to the story? Well, we're, we're constantly trying to um, enrich our story for include, including all the, the many peoples that were, are here um, and all. I'd say you know, we are uh, increasingly reaching out to uh, Native American nations so we can do a, a, a better job of uh, working with them to tell their stories within our narrative. Um, within our portrayal of, of 1774, um, it's been a great opportunity to look at uh, soldiers' wives and children, um, as well as uh, women who were in the, the townships in, in what's now Vermont and their Im impressions of, of what it was like to be here and, and their stories. And so I'd say, especially in the, the last couple of years, we have done uh, much more research and we not only sh you know, talk about, but also show uh, the lives of, of women and, and children with the army in, in much better detail than, than we ever have done before. That's great to hear and looking forward to visit one day when everything's open up again. Yes, and please. <laughs> Stuart, thank you so much for being with us today. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me and thank you for these, these great questions. I just, I just love this. <laughs> well, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, please join us again next week, Wednesday, same time, 4 p.m. as we visit the Cesar Chavez National Monument. Have a great day, everyone.